introduce me. I'm Gintare Birkenaite and I work with Greg Torda. And I'm here to talk about habitat classification of reef structures using benthic dray modeler, but also other RGIS extensions. So um, we know that tropical coral reefs are subject to a variety of stressors and disturbances such as cyclones, coral bleaching, crown of thorn starfish outbreaks. And actually according to intermediate disturbance hypothesis, um, uh, disturbance is actually maintained by diversity. Uh, however, disturbances beyond that intermediate level will uh, potentially uh, uh, degrade ecosystems, which begs the question how reefs will respond to these disturbances and what type of spatial patterns one can observe uh, in, the, in the future reefs. So um, in this study, I looked at the spatial patterns of recovery after a uh, largest cyclone in Australia in 2011 that brought wind speeds up to 285 kilometers per hour, severely damaging the eastern sides of the uh, Pelorus Reef at the Great Barrier Reef uh, on Palm Islands. Um, and I wanted specifically to examine recovery uh, beyond coral cover base metrics, um, as that's a very common way of assessing health status of the reef. Um, uh, however, I do believe that sometimes it underestimates what's really happening, with, happening within the reef. Um, and uh, I believe that there's a need to look into species specific recovery patterns. So to deconstruct the space and spatial, uh, spatial and taxonomical patterns of recovery, uh, I've co-analyzed coral data and sonar data using RGIS. Um, so coral data was actually collected in 2015 and 2017 on a continuous belt transect around the island, uh, looking at 11 different species. Um, and I utilized RGIS by um, running an optimized hotspot analysis uh, to uh, evaluate spatial autocorrelation of data points in the area, because I wanted to see where is the clustering of high coral count is in the area and uh, how patchy is the recovery. So hotspot analysis actually concluded that there's definitely differences between species and that could be attributed to, you know, coral life history traits, um, such as, for example, the four epistolata uh, marked in green here uh, is a brooding species, uh, meaning that the larvae is competent to settle close to parental colonies and therefore their hotspots actually, uh, the, and the dispersal range is way narrower compared to the spawning species such as a corpora hyacinthus um, that can, uh, disperse way, way, way more compared to um, brooders. Um, and also the shifts in community composition kind of clearly suggest that uh, the system that I'm looking at uh, is in still its infant stages of ecological secession with pioneering species um, still dominating the reef on the exposed side of the island that has been way, uh, affected way more uh, in 2011 cyclone. Um, this also kind of answers one of the questions that I had, you know, how uh, patchy is the recovery of the reef? If you were to jump in with your scuba gear on the eastern side of the island, you could say Acopora hyacinthus is recovering pretty well, but other species not so well. Um, but that would be completely opposite uh, trend if you were to jump in with your scuba gear on the western side of the island. Um, so I used hotspot analysis on coral data alone because I wanted to see um, how patchy the recovery is, but I also wanted to combine that with landscape mapping. So I collected sonar data um, with Lorentz HDS7 single beam sonar, um, um, circuit navigating the island for a couple of days. Um, and it's a super small transducer mounted to a small research vessel. And in that way, we're able to access shallow parts of the reef that is often not um, done with larger research vessels. Um, the sonar log data files were then transferred to ReefMaster software where sonar log files are trans converted to geotag depth measurements uh, and then exported to S3 shape files uh, for downstream processing in RGIS. Um, here I created digital elevation model um, based on splines with barrier interpo interpolation technique that allowed me to create a barrier around the island. Uh, and in that way, the interpolation was done not throughout the entire island. Um, this donut looking digital elevation model uh, was nine meter spatial resolution and shows a clear fringing reef morphology with a reef flat steep upper slope and a lower slope fading into the inner reef terrain. Um, and this served as the basis for benthic terrain modeler. Um, and the benthic tray modeler actually uses bathymetric position index uh, that um, is quite widely used in landscape, terrestrial landscape ecology to classify landscape structures based on the change in slope position. Uh, and the BPI is basically, basically a measure of um, a reference uh, position uh, relative to location surrounding it. Uh, and that's usually done by predefining an analyst and doing neighborhood analysis. 
Um, it's a relatively scale dependent derivative, therefore you need to adjust it for each study site. Um, so for broad scale VPI, I've chose 250, um, just because the reef is relatively small, um, for to represent larger features of the reef, such as ridge top, slope, and valleys, um, and fine scale VPI to represent uh, and tune into the smaller parts of the reef, rich uh, crests and crests on slopes. Um, and then the uh, resulting values are actually positive values representing cliff edges, upper slope, um, and ridge tops, uh, zero representing plains and constant slopes, um, and uh, more negative values representing lower slope, cliff faces, and valley bottoms, for example. So the general workflow looks like this, where you take the DEM as an original grid and you use this to calculate other derivatives. As I mentioned, broad scale BPI, fine scale BPI and slope, and to finally create a habitat map. So I've done exactly that on RGIS uh, and my Polaris uh, map looks like this. Uh, we've mapped overall two square kilometers of the reef um, and defined 13 different habitat types uh, based on previous literature. Uh, obviously adjusting that for the study side that we're looking at. Um, and then we overlapped the habitat raster with co coral data and extracted those values. Um, and then for coral data themselves, they, were, they had eight different habitats. And this is just an example of one of the corals that we looked at, Ceratopora hystrix, a beautiful uh, pink bird nest coral. Um, there's a definitely decrease in coral abundance on uh, western side of the island. That's also uh, aligns well with the hotspot analysis that I showed before. Um, and there's a decrease in abundance on flat plains between the two years. And the preferred habitat um, for Ceratopora hystrix specifically are narrow crests and crest on slopes. Um, and this could be attributed to the uh, fact that a food availability has shown to be higher where um, internal eddies and currents crash at these crests, uh, increasing coral, coral abundance in these habitats. Um, so overall we have, uh, for all the species that we looked at, for all 11 of them, we have a range of predictors of abundance related to these topographic features uh, that in turn represent different habitat types um, probably driven by different environmental variables, uh, gradients of light, temperature, and different wave exposure. So the spatial analysis of um, these two data sets actually showed two things, uh, that the patchiness of, re of recovery is definitely clear, and that was shown by a hotspot analysis, um, and that was actually captured for the first time in the study on a reef scale, um, and that clearly uh, shows that uh, Coral cover alone would not be sufficient enough to uh, understand the dynamics within the reef, specifically trying to look at transects and uh, quadrants and comparing that to these techniques. Um, and, and often that would, in that way, uh, with these common surveying methods, um, ecological succession features would be lost uh, and uh, you would not be able to see them. Uh, also taxonomic patterns in relation to benthic features were very clear. I've only shown one example, but pretty much all the species that were looked at had different preferences for where to live. Um, and that was uh, aided by the benthic terrain modeler. Um, and overall, I think the data produced here could really help uh, and could be, be used to create uh, species distribution models um, on the scale of entire reef. Um, this also could be, the data could also be used to evaluate um, theoretical versus realized recovery should another disturbance happen, um, especially in Australia this year uh, is predicted to have a La Nina year uh, and five to six cyclones are predicted to pass through tropical Queensland. Um, and so therefore it's, it's, chances are very high that the system that I looked at um, will be knocked back down to level zero of ecological secession. Um, that's sad news for the reefs, but I do believe that um, habitat mapping with either pre-existing data um, or if you're going into the field, I think it's a really great valuable tool for uh, reef monitoring on conservation efforts. Specifically, um, you don't necessarily need to use sonar data. You could also use satellite imagery um, and overall produce really quite amazing results uh, from very user-friendly uh, extensions of RGIS. So I'm very happy I found that. And uh, thank you so much for listening for my talk. If you have any questions, um, more than happy to answer them. Or if you can, you can also email them to me or my supervisor. Thank you.